This Week in the Boardroom, brought to you by Corporate Board Member and host NYSE Euronext, along with Governance Knowledge Partners, the Center for Audit Quality, and Grant Thornton, and contributing partners, National Investor Relations Institute, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals. Welcome to this edition of This Week in the Boardroom. I'm T.K. Kerstetter with Corporate Board Member, and we're going to be looking at an interesting topic today. We're going to be talking about uh, compensation chair challenges. And joining me, who finds himself in that position, um, is Shan Atkins, who's the compensation chair for Pep Boys, Manny, Mo, and Jack. Also serves on the board of Spartan Stores and Tim Horton, Inc. So, Shan, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks for having me, TK. Glad to be here. And as a comp chair, I guess the best place uh, for me to start is, you know, it used to be, again, the audit committee that had all the attention, you know, um, Dodd-Frank comes, other changes by the SEC, all of a sudden the comp committee is the hot committee and has all the focus, and now we certainly see that from investors. But talk a little bit about how your compensation committees have changed in the way of the types of discussion you're having with the onset of both the SEC regulations and then subsequently Dodd-Frank. Well, I became chair of the comp committee at the Pep Boys three years ago, so I guess you could say it was a triple witching hour from the standpoint of all the changes that were going on. And I had served on a couple of public company comp committees before, but not as chair. And so we, we really decided with everything going on in, in the environment that we were going to do an essentially a total reboot of our executive compensation program. Uh, Pep Boys is a 90-year-old company, but in recent years has been quite challenged from a performance point of view with a lot of the changes going on in the industry. It's a, a turnaround in process. We've had a lot of management change, and we felt like our executive comp program wasn't really serving our purpose the way we needed it to. So we tried to look at what was going on out there in the world of comp, the changes that were thought to be better practices in the world of comp, and while being informed by those, not be a slave to them either, we wanted to try to design a, a new set of programs, particularly on the incentive side, that we thought would serve us better. So, so the last three years have been actually quite action-packed for us at Pep Boys as we tried to conceive that new program, put it in place, see how it was doing in terms of altering management behavior, see how well correlated our payouts actually were to the company's performance, which obviously is something everyone's trying to achieve these days. And now, having just completed the first LTI cycle, which was three years long, and the new program redesign, we're, we're in the process of taking a look and, and changing it again. So I would say there was sort of a design element to what we did, and then also a disclosure side of it, too. We really have been trying to think of our cDNA as a marketing document to explain what we're doing, and a lot has changed in the way we're presenting and explaining our information. It's going to be an interesting season, I think, around cDNA this year. I think that uh, a lot of people are trying to put it into terms that everybody can understand. And if you have to have all the information on the back end of that, that's great. But try and explain it so that people can understand it. Well, I think historically most cDNAs have been written by general counsel. And uh, I love general counsel, especially when they keep me out of trouble. But uh, they're not the best in general at writing things that are brief and in plain speak. And so we have dramatically shortened our disclosures, made a lot of use of things like executive summaries, bullet points, tables, all the things everyone's talking about, because they just help an average reader understand what you're doing and why so much better. You know, when I look at um, the committees and look at the board of directors, we used to advise people that to directors to try and ignore what's happening around them and just do the right thing. Um, probably about two years ago, we had to revise that, you know, when the shareholder communications was really building yes. and the investor focus. We sort of changed that to do the right thing, but be sure that you're, you know, you're, you're listening to what the uh, proxy advisors and the shareholders are saying because that is an element that can't be ignored now, and I'm sure you're seeing that in the comp committee. Oh, yes, very much so. We're finding that uh, shareholders are wanting to talk about compensation. 
uh, much more than in the past. And uh, m all of my companies really are in the process of having more systematic conversations with major holders. And whereas in days gone by, those might have been more around business strategy and what are you trying to achieve, sort of a more classic investor presentation. Now those conversations always include how does the executive comp program work? Explain to me, the investor, why that's the right design that's going to drive the kind of behavior that you believe is going to yield results. You know, I, I think, um, in a sense, this was more of a large uh, cap company phenomenon initially, but it seems to have really broadened into the middle market, too. Um, my experience north of the border is interesting as well, because in Canada, for a number of years now, there's been an organization called the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance which is comprised of pretty much all the major institutional holders in the country. And they got together, oh, going on 10 years ago, and uh, decided to very systematically reach out to all the large cap issuers in the, in, the, in the country, as well as some others that they thought were interesting or problematic for whatever reason, and invite the board chair and the chair of the compensation committee, not the CEO or, and not the general counsel, to a meeting where these kinds of matters were discussed, and in particular, executive compensation was talked about. So in a sense, Canada sort of led the way there, I think, with some of this early activity many, many years ago. Now we're seeing, obviously, these kind of conversations being very widespread in the US, although there isn't one monolithic um, organization that represents institutional holders in general, the way there is up there. Well, um, it, it's interesting. One of the uh, as a segue, one of the things that I have always wanted to ask the compensation chair about, and, and you have the benefit of multiple boards, but and more importantly, you have the benefit of interacting with your peers, and particularly in the conference, you know, uh, compensation conference that you and I were part <laughs> of. But my question is, do you see senior officers sort of getting it, meaning are they, when you when the compensation committee has to meet with them, do they understand why there has to be changes that these red flags are things that are creating extra focus and are they, do you find that through your peers and through your own companies, do you find that um, senior officers are, are pretty knowledgeable about all this stuff or, or do you find that still some heels are being dug in? You know, I think officers are, you know, they read the newspaper. They, they, they're in these conversations with investors and getting asked these questions. I, I, I do think that there is generally much more recognition that some of these legacy pay practices that are really not thought to be correct anymore do need to change. And, you know, my own experience is that I've had good results, actually, working with incumbent CEOs, addressing things like legacy change of control, agreements that involved gross-ups where we, we just said, look, we, this is so out of step with what's viewed as appropriate now, just can't work this way. We've got to right. redo. And uh, although I won't say that everyone's crazy about having that conversation the first time the, the topic is raised, uh, in every case I've been involved in, we've actually been able to get to a meeting of the minds and, and make the changes that were necessary to address some of these pay practices that these days are regarded as more problematic and out of favor. Yeah, it's nice to know that logic does prevail, um, even in those situations where there's you know, pressure. I, I would say, though, you know, I, I, perhaps I benefit from having been in some companies where the, the average tenure of the CEO hasn't been exceptionally long. I think uh, it might be much more challenging in a situation where you had a legacy CEO who had been there for many years and the company performance was excellent. I think the tone of that conversation might be quite different. When you have a rookie CEO or someone that hasn't been in the seat very long who was in the marketplace recently and knows what's normal in incoming deals, it's, uh, there's, I, I think that tends to breed a little more flexibility, perhaps. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, one of the questions that we like to ask everybody that comes on, especially experienced directors like yourselves, is we like to ask you to look in your crystal ball. And we mo always want to um, uh, find out that um, when you look at the recent trends in the boardroom and you look out into the future, what concerns you about those trends and then what encourages you about those trends? So how would you answer that question? Well, I think I share the concern that many directors have of agenda creep and the, 
a lot of the discussion around the board table being sacrificed in favor of more compliance-oriented activities that really aren't around the core of the business. And uh, I kind of have a rule of thumb when I go to a board meeting. If we haven't spent half our time that we're together talking about what's working and what's not working in the business strategy and on the not working side, what are we going to do about it or try to do about it, I don't think we've spent our time well. But every meeting is a battle to make sure you can spend that kind of proportion of your quality time together that's so valuable focused on those kinds of things. So, so that's sort of my concern and watch out in, in every boardroom I sit in. On the plus side, I, you know, I do think that one of the things that's happened relative to 10 or 15 years ago when I first became involved with public boards and over the last decade that I've served as a full-time corporate director in a number of situations, I really do think that boards are not in management's pocket. Uh, boards are really looking out for shareholders and uh, I know that sometimes investors will say, you know, why'd you pay this guy this way for the results that came out? or I'm not happy with the return this share, this share investment of mine has been delivering over time. Boards, I think, on balance, really are trying to do the right thing. And when I think about my earlier life uh, in the consulting world, where I spent a lot of time in corporate boardrooms of varying sizes, I think the conversation is really different in the boardroom, and it is much more focused on results. And the, and the, the capital impatience that I think investors have is very much understood by the average public company director these days. Results matter, and you want to get them as quickly as you can. Well, I think that's a great point, and uh, we hear a lot of people being concerned about the compliance aspect and the regu regulatory aspect of, of what's happening. Um, and I think the point that you make, we don't have to look back that many years to see significant change on what's happened in the boardroom. And uh, my big goal is to make sure that board leadership continues to make progress, because that to me is the difference you know, to an effective board and that. So, Shan, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank and you for having me. Great. And that will conclude this edition of This Week in the Boardroom. We hope you enjoyed today's show. We'll be back again next week when we take a look at another key topic that will help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. Join us again next week for This Week in the Boardroom, brought to you by corporate board member and host NYSE Euronext, along with Governance Knowledge Partners, the Center for Audit Quality, and Grant Thornton and contributing partners, National Investor Relations Institute and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals.